Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Catherine Marshall, uh, speaking from Washington, D.C., from the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. Uh, this is a, a conversation about peace, about interreligious relationships, and particularly about a culture of encounter. And in that sense, it's one of a series of conversations that we are hosting at the Berkeley Center about these vital issues. Uh, and today we have um, the great pleasure of a remarkable colleague, uh, Fadi Dao, who's speaking from Geneva, uh, who, uh, is, uh, who has a remarkable diverse background. Uh, some practical housekeeping details. Uh, this event is being recorded and the video will be available on the website and will be sent to everyone who registered. Uh, we have a Q&A button, question and answer at the bottom and encourage you to pose any questions uh, that you have. And I think that those are the, um, those are the housekeeping details. So with that, um, Fadi has so many different um, incarnations in his life as a scholar, a peace builder, uh, interreligious dialogue scholar, <clears throat> etc. Um, I think the, the best is for him to introduce uh, himself a little bit and tell us particularly what do you think this culture of encounter is about? Hello, Catherine. And uh, uh, hello, everybody uh, watching us and, and hearing us. Uh, um, thank you for um, inviting me to join this uh, discussion about the culture of uh, encounter. Um, if I can skip the first part of the question, presenting myself, because uh, as, you, as you said, it's always uh, complicated to talk about, you, you, uh, you put it this way, many incarnations, let's say, or when we have uh, many dimensions of, of engagement. Uh, very briefly, I'm currently based in Geneva, working with the University of Geneva on a project on uh, uh, multi-religious and inter-religious engagement for development and peace. So connecting the uh, academic work, theological work uh, with the uh, practice on the ground uh, through uh, mainly international organizations, UN agencies and uh, and other type of institutions um, engaging religion in their in their mission and development or in, in peace uh, making and peace building. Uh, this is what I'm currently doing. In addition to my continuous engagement with uh, a foundation that I contributed with other friends to create many years ago called Adian Foundation. It's based in Lebanon and works mainly on the MENA region, but, but beyond also uh, on issues related to uh, diversity management and and uh, uh, the governance of pluralism you know and uh, uh, conflict and uh, management and and post-conflict reconciliations and society especially when it is also related to religious issues or religious uh, religiously expressed conflicts um, and i'm also a theologian i worked on uh, the theology of uh, pluralism or other religions from a christian uh, perspective uh, and very interested also in Middle Eastern questions and Islam. So this is briefly about me. Uh, then the second part of your question, it's about uh, this uh, uh, culture of encounter or the concept of encounter. And you know, your invitation uh, to join this conversation reminded me that one of my first academic articles was about a theology of encounter. In fact, I, and I tried it's, uh, it was in 2005, I think, published. Uh, I tried in this article to, to promote the concept of encounter as a wider approach to see interreligious dialogue. And, uh, and so to set the interreligious dialogue in a framework, I mean, to frame this interreligious dialogue uh, 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 in a relational way, which the encounter could uh, uh, offer to, uh, to dialogue. So to uh, to make sure that dialogue and specifically interreligious and interface dialogue is not restricted, you know, to either intellectual exchanges between scholars uh, or just institutional relations between people representing their, their communities. It's also 
I mean, dialogue, when it is framed uh, uh, with the concept of encounter, it's something uh, that becomes much more dynamic and engage people in their daily life and communities in their daily life and, and uh, pushes them uh, towards their, uh, what I would call, and this is the concept that we worked on it in at the Ann Foundation, the, the religious social responsibility that pushes religious communities, religious actors to, to be aware that they have a social responsibility and even they are accountable to uh, uh, towards their, their social work and, and commitments in their societies. So this is, I would say, starting by these uh, few elements about, about encounter. Uh, but of course, this is a, a, a much um, richer concept that we can, we can continue discussing it. I would love us to come back um, to some of these questions around pluralism and the, the different ways in which it plays out. But maybe you can take us back into the Abu Dhabi uh, meeting uh, between the Pope and the Sheikh of Al-Azhar. How did that happen? And when did you come to be involved in that? This is a crucial event, you know, in our recent history. I think this is uh, this we, we would um, understand uh, uh, the importance of this of this event in the coming years more than what we do now. It, it, it's a kind of not only a turning point in Christian Muslim relations, specifically between the Catholic Church, you know, and and the Sunni Muslim community Al Azhar, uh, uh, but but uh, beyond being this kind of turning point in these relations, it is also I think a new paradigm in engaging with each other uh, as religious uh, uh, leaders. Uh, because uh, this, uh, this event of Abu Dhabi, and we will talk about its content now, but, but from, from, I would say, the, uh, the formal aspect of it, uh, it is, first of all, uh, an encounter. I think it, it, I can say even it was possible only because the successful encounter that happened between Pope Francis and the, the Grand Imam Ahmad al -Tayyib. If uh, If you remember, and uh, uh, our audience uh, uh, remembers, that um, before Pope Francis, the, the relations were extremely tense between, uh, between Rome, I mean, the Catholic Church, and specifically Al-Azhar, uh, representing in a way the, the Sunni community uh, in the Muslim world uh, because of many, many problems happened. And even at some point, the relation was completely uh, cut between, between these two institutions. And it was uh, able to, they were able to reconnect again. First of all, because I think of the very charismatic personality of Pope Francis, who, who, uh, who's a person who, you know, um, uh, uh, doesn't hesitate going beyond, you know, some protocol uh, things and uh, and so he wanted to to uh, uh, rebuild this bridge I would say with the, with the Al Azhar as the kind of representative of the Muslim world especially the Sunni community on the Muslim world um, and at the same time the successful experience between these two men I mean who met met each other many many times I think the, uh, they are the um, top religious leaders who, who met the most often if we compare them to others. I mean, so, so uh, there were a, a personal relation, uh, first of all, you know, behind, behind uh, this, uh, this process or at the beginning of this process. And both of them, they don't hesitate at any moment to call each other as friends and brothers, you know? Uh, so not only giving the example to their communities that we can be from different religions, and specifically Christian and Muslim, and call each other and sin sincerely engage with each, which is others as friends and as brothers and sisters. So this is, I think, a, a very strong element uh, that helped to progressively build on it uh, many milestones leading to the 2019 uh, Abu Dhabi event. Because before the 2019 event, we should remember that in 2017, Pope Francis visited uh, Cairo and met uh, the Grand Imam there and together uh, participated to a conference on uh, citizenship, pluralism, freedom, and coexistence. 
this was the title of, of, of this conference, very important conference. Uh, and before that, uh, the Grand Imam, uh, Sheikh Ahmad Tayyip, visited Pope Francis in Rome also. So uh, there were very important milestones leading to uh, this event that happened in Abu Dhabi and launching the um, uh, declaration on human uh, fraternity. And I think the importance of this event, of course, it's uh, by itself, again, as a, as a paradigm, but at the same time, the output of this event, the result of this event, which is the text itself of the mm -hmm. declaration and its richness. So then if we look uh, a step ahead to the encyclical, the Fratelli Tutti, but the continuing effort to make this culture of encounter something broader, uh, you've been involved in a number of of ways, maybe you could tell us about them and how you see the significance of the of the follow up steps. Um, the the event itself is huge, and the text um, is uh, so important and in you in some aspects that I would say it would require uh, uh, from us in a way to be patient in the reception phase. I mean, it will take many years to give all its fruits. This is like, you know, this text is like a seed for a, for a tree that was, was, was put on the ground, but it will take some years to start giving its fruits. Why I'm saying this? Because at the same time, this is unique. We don't have other texts with this high level of religious leaders uh, who signed it because it's a co-signed text. So, so both of them, the Pope and the Grand Imam are saying that they are, they are um, giving, um, they are endorsing and giving theological, I would say, legitimacy to the content of this text from both so, uh, Muslim and Christian uh, perspectives. Uh, so, so this is by itself uh, a, a unique, uh, a unique uh, text that we have endorsed from this level of, of religious leadership, and then by the content of the text, because the text is, uh, I think, bringing uh, lots of um, aspects that I believe in the, in the near future and midterm and long-term future uh, will, will create a, a new type of types of dynamism in interreligious relation, but not only, it's also in the religious engagement and social and global questions and affairs. And this can, is a Can you give dimension. us a couple of examples? Yes, what because, are examples? Yeah, the, the subtitle, in fact, of the text itself speaks about peace and coexistence because it's a human fraternity for peace and coexistence. Mm -hmm. So so this gives directly a direction for the text that it's not just a, a religious statement. Uh, 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 where believer can just benefit from it to, you know, uh, enrich their beliefs and their own values, either Christians or Muslim. It's beyond that because it's speaking about uh, uh, coexistence and peace and making peace and living together in peace. So this is this is saying something very strong that Christians and Muslim can be co-responsible together uh, uh, in social. And, and global affairs like living together, like peace, and even the text uh, includes some aspects of uh, what we call today or we put under the development uh, agenda. Um, uh, and, and it goes beyond because what, uh, what the text uh, uh, or how the text presents itself, in fact, it's very interesting because it's, it starts speaking in the name of God. So the two leaders are speaking in the name of God, but at the same time, in the name of all who are suffering, you know, in our world. So it gives directly universal dimension that we are, I mean, they are speaking as religious leaders, but at the same time as concerned with the global humanity and its uh, problems and challenges. Um, and then directly after the text start engaging so many categories in our society of people to, to join this movement, I would say, or this dynamism, and to become partner together with religious communities and religious leaders to face the world global challenges today. So they call for, you know, uh, uh, policymakers, but, but at the same time, 
educators, uh, even artists, all categories of, uh, uh, of uh, social actors, I would say, in, in so many uh, different ways. So this is interesting because uh, uh, this is also presenting the religious leadership not as a, a, a leadership who is dictating what to do and asking others to do it. it the text is, is presenting the religious leadership as uh, partners among others, sharing their values uh, and asking others to join them also and to work together as partners uh, to face uh, the uh, world challenges today. Uh, to give, um, uh, I, I know uh, you, you asked me and I know you, you want some concrete also uh, examples of how this is translated into, into reality. Uh, the text uh, speak, for example, speaks about, uh, uh, so some, some, I would say, uh, very general problems in our world, like poverty, you know, like disparities in societies, but these are huge. Even women, uh, women's situation and, and women rights, education, children. So the text enumerates lots, lots of uh, challenges in our world, uh, facing religious extremism also and terrorism. Uh, but at the same time, all the environmental uh, uh, challenges are, are mentioned. Uh, so I, I, I know that you and, and our audience and people would expect and to, to, to hear, okay, but since that time, we are speaking about 2019, so two years ago, what happened? Uh, uh, something uh, uh, has been taken into, you know, uh, on the practical level, uh, some actions were, uh, were made. It's difficult to answer this question because in fact, of course we know it's not the Pope Francis or Sheikh Imam Al-Azhar who will personally uh, um, engage in, in, in a practical project to, to, uh, to contribute in facing one of these challenges. But what happened, their both communities became more aware about their responsibility uh, to engage with other partners in facing these challenges. One example is the refugee one. I think everybody saw and, and we are seeing how much the Pope is taking this uh, in, in a very serious way. I mean, this, this challenge and, uh, and shifting the narrative also about, about refugees. You know, if I take the example of some European countries where this topic is being, is feeding some populist politics, you know, and some uh, 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 xenophobic uh, 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 narratives, you know, and, and feelings where you have the Pope uh, taking, taking the narrative uh, totally in the opposite direction and showing how much uh, uh, refugees are brothers and sisters who, who are calling for, for support and, and assistance. This is a very practical example. It is not being done uh, together, Christian and Muslim in a way, because I think uh, what is important, it's not that always to, to work together and, in an interreligious framework, but is to be aware together that this is a religious responsibility and, and each one in, in his or her own uh, place to take this responsibility seriously. So we saw, for example, churches being open to refugees without asking if they were Christian or Muslim. So the first, even I'm not speaking about uh, unfortunately, the new wave of refugees today in Europe was the uh, was the war, the horrible war in Ukraine. But even uh, before, you know, with the previous uh, uh, problems, more in the MENA region, the Syria problem, Afghanistan, and others, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Iraqi refugees, and we we saw concretely that uh, uh, Christian communities, for example, in, in Europe, became um, much more aware about their responsibility, and not only aware but uh, 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 much uh, and more um, uh, open to, to engage and to host and to, to support refugees. Yeah, those are some very interesting and important points. I think the idea of the common awareness, but people operating differently within their context. I want to come back to the sort of Rome side of this uh, in a minute, but meanwhile, you had mentioned earlier the pluralism platform and pluralism issues within a more Middle Eastern Muslim world context. Maybe you could comment both on, on how you see the problem, but also 
the platform that you have been part of creating and mm -hmm. where, where you see the interest changing and shifting there? Yeah, I mean, to make a long story short, I would say for me, pluralism is the answer to extremism because all types of extremism are always based on exclusion, you know, and on, uh, on um, uh, building on, uh, on an exclusive narrative, you know, an uh, identity-based narrative where the others are automatically uh, discriminated uh, uh, and marginalized and sometimes persecuted. So uh, I do believe, and not only conceptually, theoretically, but also in practice, because, because we experienced this, that uh, the, the real antidote to extremism uh, is pluralism, is promoting pluralism in societies. But pluralism is difficult, you know, unfortunately, because people are, I mean, it's easy, easier for people uh, to, and, and sometimes it's more comfortable. It's a kind of comfort zone, you know, for people to be uh, um, in, in, in the framework of, uh, of a monolithic, I would say, identity or society or narrative uh, because uh, deference is always challenging. Diversity is always challenging. It's because it's always bringing something different, bringing something new uh, uh, to what we are used to to live or to think or to practice. So, so um, it's not. Uh, I mean, we cannot uh, consider it that it's it's something like we, we take it for granted that it's and it's just we speak about pluralism and it will happen. It's not true. Diversity is a fact. But this fact to become pluralism in the meaning that adopted and endorsed by people, transforming their values and making from their values, you know, coherent with the pluralistic framework that they see it as a richness and not as a threat for them. This is a huge process to move from a fact, you know, to, to a value system and to a culture. This is a huge process. Um, and, and the facts, of diversity, unfortunately, can also be utilized and manipulated by those who want to build their power uh, on the exclusion of the others. So this is all the populist, you know, uh, politics or identity-based politics or extremist groups and and so on. So I'm I'm, I'm saying I'm mean, making this introduction to say should not taking for taking it for granted. Uh, building pluralism is a, is a very challenging process, but says it is, again, for me, the best antidote for, for all types of extremism in our society. So how we can do it? I think uh, we need some pillars to build it. And, and among those pillars is, first of all, I would say, uh, uh, religious and cultural literacy. You cannot ask people to be open and uh, and uh, and uh, you know welcoming uh, the others who are different if they don't know about them, because ignorance is always the source of fear, the source uh, you know of um, uh, misconceptions, uh, the source of mistrust. So when people are in ignorance, uh, uh, this is very easy then to. Uh, to to manipulate them, you know, and and to feed these feelings, negative feelings of mistrust and and uh, those misconceptions. So first of all, one of the basic pillar is uh, uh, cultural and religious literacy. It's to know about the other. Unfortunately, look at our educational systems in all the world globally. I would say, of course, it's much more poorer in in the MENA region and Arab world, but even in in the uh, uh, developed, I would say, countries and you know, Western countries, we don't do enough in education. Uh, uh, we don't have enough place for cultural and religious literacy, uh, and this is one of the sources of the social uh, tensions and lack of cohesion in some well-established liberal democracies. But of course, it's much more um, uh, uh, problematic in countries uh, where you have. Uh, a predominance, pre predominance of one culture or one religion, you know, with a, with a one historic narrative that is in favor of one community against the other or excluding the other community. So this is the case in most of the MENA Middle Eastern uh, countries. So first pillar is cultural and religious literacy. The second pillar is critical thinking. 
you know, uh, because uh, uh, it's absolutely needed uh, this skill of critical thinking to be able to uh, not only question the other or question the social dynamics, but also question ourselves and our communities and our narrative and the narratives that is vehiculated, you know, in our communities or, also on, on, or in our families or, you know, our tradition. So the second pillar for pluralism is critical thinking. And this is something extremely important. The third pillar is empathy. And these are for me the three pillars to, to, to build a process of, of a culture of pluralism and, and, and related values. Because without empathy, you will have critical thinking, but you will, you will always use critical thinking against the other. But with empathy, critical thinking becomes a, a, a shared reflection with the other for the common good, for the shared good of, of the two. You know? And when you have the, the, the literacy uh, uh, as a first layer, so this, this becomes a very strong uh, uh, process, I would say, in uh, uh, building pluralism. And believe me, this is life changing. And I saw this when I was more involved with the Adyan Foundation. We launched a, a platform and a media platform, a digital media platform uh, called in Arabic Ta'addudiya. This is the word of, I mean, to say pluralism in Arabic. Uh, and uh, so if, uh, if among our audience people who read Arabic, they can enter um, Ta'addudiya, T A A D U Y. IA.com, so Ta'adudiya, uh, and they will, uh, and um, they, they can find the different social media pages, but also the website, uh, the main platform. So what is Ta'adudiya? What is this platform? It is a, a space where we have uh, tens more now than 50 or 60, uh, I would say, uh, change maker uh, from all Middle Eastern countries, most of them young, and half of them women, including women from Saudi Arabia, women from Yemen, from Iraq, you know, from Syria, and all those countries are writing in a regular way, uh, like op-eds, you know, short articles, uh, with this critical thinking, so challenging some established negative uh, either pra social practices or, or, or uh, social values, in fact. Uh, based on concrete reality in their different countries. Uh, this is one aspect of the content. The other aspect of the content, what we called, in fact, because we created this platform also to face the whole ISIS, you know, the Islamic State narrative and its strengths on digital media also at that time. So I want to, to, to fade them. Uh, so we created also, we developed a concept, we called it existential narrative, because we believe that there is the best counter narrative to, to the extremist one, it's not just to say that they are wrong and what is right. Uh, uh, this, I mean, it proved that this is not really uh, succeeding in facing them, but what, what uh, we thought and proved that this is the way to do it is rather than saying, is showing people who are doing exactly the opposite of, of those extremist and, and, and terrorist people. Because when, we, when, when I was asking people, you know, in the uh, uh, years of uh, 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 the Islamic State, you know, right, in the, in, the, in the region, why you are, because some people and lots of people were seduced by them. So what attracts you? And the answer was, they are sincere. They are doing what they believe in. So they are, I mean, what attracted people uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, some of them joined uh, uh, this terrorist group was the fact that they are not just preaching, they are doing what they believe in. And so we wanted to do exactly the same to show that there are other people who are doing what they believe in as positive values and values for pluralism and living together. So we were filming short stories mm -hmm. and, and showing them on, uh, uh, on this platform and they reached more than 80 million reach in, in two, three years, three, three years uh, which led ISIS itself, the Islamic State from Raqqa in their, in their headquarters at that time to do a video to respond to us, to respond to this platform. Uh, and so, uh, and to attack our servers and so on. Just I'm giving this example to say, pluralism is a long process. 
Of course, media is crucial and social media and digital media because it provides people you know, the tools uh, for diversity uh, uh, literacy, uh, uh, but also for critical thinking, to think with others and for empathy, you know, to meet others and to connect with others through, uh, through uh, 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 social media. And this is why I, um, I, I really believe, because we experienced it, that lots of young people, I, I mentioned 80 million reached, most of them are between 16 and 35 years old. I think more than 65% of the population. So, which means that the Arab, young Arab population or in the Middle East are eager you know, to see a good examples of, uh, of, uh, of people living with others and, and working for pluralistic uh, societies and, and coexistence and, and eager to hold uh, those values too, which is a sign of hope uh, regardless of all the, you know, the very um, uh, uh, sad and, uh, and, and difficult situation that this region is going through. So, um, by the way, it is 8-0. Um, 80 million that you, you said. I was very much exactly. struck by that number. We exactly. have a couple of questions already that touch on this. The first one is that somebody wants the website uh, um, on the chat, but if not, if we can't get the Arabic writing into the chat, we'll certainly send it out afterwards. No, I will, I will also, put it, okay, I will put it in the it. chat because it is in, in the Latin, you know, English uh, uh, okay. character. And now we have, um, this is from someone who's anonymous, but I'm not um, clear about how to define uh, ta uh, adi India. Is it plurality or pluralism? Is pluralism integration and inclusion or diversity? We have this constant debate about whether it's a of salad course. or a minestrone or um, a blended. So perhaps you could comment on the of language. Course. Yeah, yeah, this is very uh, uh, theoretical debate, I would say. But to make it uh, 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 to make it simple, not to shift to an academic uh, discussion here. Uh, at least in my uh, way of using uh, this vocabulary, I consider diversity is a fact. It's a reality. It's a fact. So uh, uh, we, without any uh, value based connotation you know this is diversity i would put plurality with it you know plurality it's a fact to recognize that there are different groups different communities different religions different cultures composing a society this is the fact pluralism is the process of making from this fact a rich reality you know uh, uh, so this is at least the way i'm using uh, these words to be uh, uh, to, to be understood. I mean, uh, uh, but of course we can uh, we can put lots of nuances uh, uh, with this. I'm, I'm, I will uh, uh, just uh, uh, let's say uh, making this uh, simple distinction between diversity and plurality as a fact, pluralism as a process of making from this fact a rich a rich reality, mm -hmm. and you know building resilience also within this uh, this reality not to turn into division conflict and so on let's come back a little bit to the rome side of this and to the sequel uh to the abu dhabi meeting and, yeah. and here's one question there that's really uh, you've emphasized in an earlier discussion that this is both about two people um and very personal but it's also obviously about a much broader set of issues, but this comes back to the people. So what factors do you think triggered or are driving Pope Francis to emphasize interreligious dialogue with Islam during his papacy, papacy compared to Popes John Paul II and Benedict um, XVI? They are very different, the three popes. In fact, it's very difficult to compare them because they are very spe specifically in relation to this question of you know, the, the relation of Christianity uh, with Islam or their relation to Islam. Of course, John Paul II was very open, you know, to uh, engage with Muslim communities. He is, uh, you know, uh, the Pope who went to uh, Rabat in Morocco uh, uh, and had a gathering with the Moroccan youths who are all Muslims, were gathered in the stadium, you know, the football stadium of Rabat. Uh, I think there were around 40,000 uh, young people. And this, this gathering was uh, meant by, by the king uh, himself. I mean, 
uh, asking the Pope to address and to speak to the Moroccan youth. So this is a, a unique event. And then the same Pope, you know, John Paul II, uh, during his celebration of the, uh, uh, you know, the entry of the third millennium, Christian uh, millennium. So he went to the Middle East, visiting many countries and specifically to Damascus. And he went to the Omeyyad mosques entered the mosque and, and prayed within the mosque, known as being also uh, built on a previous uh, 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 church for John Baptist. So um, he, he was very uh, strongly engaged with, uh, with Muslim communities. And I think with the, even the Assisi event 1986, when he gathered uh, top uh, religious leaders from all the world to pray together for peace. So he sent a strong message for the Christians themselves and the Catholic Church and for the world, for the other religions that uh, the Christian or the Catholic Church want to be uh, uh, with other with the other religious communities together working for peace and praying together for peace. So uh, uh, this is a paradigm that John Paul II created and it was difficult to go backward uh, uh, from there. Uh, Benedictus was uh, had a complex relation with the Muslim world in fact and it went into ups and downs. Uh, he had some very strong, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, engagement, but at the same time, uh, it is a, a known being the, the, the conference of Rexbond he gave in Germany, and uh, he used the quote that was interpreted as he was accusing Islam being a religious of violence, and it created lots of problems. And this is what led, in fact, of the rupture of relations between Al-Azhar and the Vatican, this conference of, of uh, Benedict. So then uh, Francis came with a completely different approach. In fact, I think uh, uh, based on his experience in, um, uh, uh, in his country at the beginning and then uh, uh, his, his personal relations also, he wanted to invite religions, starting by, by Islam, but not only Islam, uh, inviting religions to become more humanistic, I would say, with Christians themselves, I mean, with the Christian church. So to, to care more about the fate of humanity rather than debating uh, about the historic uh, problem, interreligious problems. And so uh, this was very clear in his encyclical about you know, the environment, uh, uh, Laudato Si, when he wrote this very beautiful text, uh, uh, our responsibility to our common, uh, common home, he called the, the the planet Earth, uh, and then Fratelli Tutti, the other text about fraternity. So I think he engaged religions uh, uh, on this track of uh, uh, responsibility, human responsibility, shared the human responsibility, which shifted the narrative and uh, from you know historic debates uh, uh, to 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 current and future responsibilities, uh, and and I think we had the chance that uh, the Grand Imam Ahmad Tayyib also uh, was very uh, sensitive to, to, uh, to this approach. And so he joined him uh, in, in, uh, in this approach. And then let's not forget that uh, when, uh, when Pope Francis visited Iraq last year, he also wanted to meet the Grand Ayatollah Stani, who was one of the top leaders in the Shia community, the other branch, main branch in Islam. And they had the same talks and, and the same agreement also that they share uh, and they should focus on our shared responsibility for our current and future uh, uh, days. Both um, Islamic traditions, and I'm going to say through lived religion and through some of the formal processes, there are questions about how this links to the principle of equality between men and women. Um, so I'm interested in, you, you mentioned before that there are a lot of women participating in the pluralism platform, but yeah. how do you think that that is playing out in this interreligious uh, challenge, shall we say, that's been put by the two leaders? Very honestly and openly, this is a, a, a very important question that should uh, invite all religions and I will start by mine, by Christianity and by the Catholic Church, to be very humble and not preaching, you know, uh, the word of what we should do, because we have the problems also that we are carrying inside our institutions and our communities. I mean, the, the situation of women in all the religions, but specifically, I would take the example of the Catholic Church, 
is not is not at all acceptable in the uh, uh, in the norms and values of our uh, our life today. It's of course more problematic also in the Islamic community. So I, I'm I'm glad that you raised this question to say that it, it's it's very important to help religious communities. To understand, we, we need a kind of gender literacy within religious communities because, because the narrative is, is not enough sensitive and open to, to this question. And it's happening, but slowly. I think we need more engagement on this question uh, and, uh, and uh, maybe more good examples to, to, to promote also. Um, and at the same time, I think this is a very good reminder for religious communities to stay humble and, and while engaging, uh, facing social challenges, to know that uh, we can engage together or with partners in, the, in, in society who, who have uh, different uh, perceptions, let's say, for example, about women and the role of women, uh, but we can work on a, on a third question together. To give an example, if, take the example of the refugees, for example, re refugee crisis. Uh, Christian, Muslim, but also uh, civil society organizations, international organizations can collaborate together. You know, the UNHCR, the, the, the United Nations Agency for Refugees, they established a multi-religious uh, board uh, for, for this agency to engage, to better engage with religious communities in facing this the huge challenge of refugees in the world today. Why we know that uh, the UN agencies, for example, uh, have a completely different uh, understanding of, uh, of uh, gender and uh, equality and the role of women and uh, than uh, uh, religious communities and the Catholic church or the Islamic world. So we can engage together, although we, we have some big disparities and, and differences on, on key issues like, like women, but at the same time, I think we should be open to be challenged by others and here by the society uh, uh, to uh, to evolve uh, and to to understand. I mean, why uh, uh, this gender equality and the role of women in um, uh, within communities and in society is uh, so important. Pope Francis, if I speak about uh, the Catholic Church, is trying to do some efforts. For my personal judgment, it's not at all enough. He just launched uh, uh, last week or two weeks ago a new kind of constitution in the management of the central uh, body of uh, governance in, in Rome, I mean, what we call the curia in, uh, in the Christian uh, vocabulary, where he put in this new constitution that any uh, um, institution within Rome, uh, uh, like the, they call the dicasteries or the councils, can be head, headed by uh, or led by a woman. So we, we don't need, because the tradition until now was, we always uh, uh, were looking for cardinals, you know, for an ordained man with a, with a level of, uh, I mean, cardinal authority. So now any woman can become the, the head of one of, of those departments in, in, in Rome, which is a very big step done. Not enough. We need to do much more, I think. And of course, we, we need to, either from inside, or from outside to continue having critical thinking with empathy, but also with enough uh, uh, courage to challenge the, the situation. I think it is also interesting to look at the interreligious movements and to see this strong participation of women exactly. uh, in leadership, but also, of course, in making things happen. Exactly. Um, I, I would like to give an example because you raised this and this is very, very uh, relevant point, uh, Catherine. I think that the world is not noticing the huge progress being done within religious communities on this question. Lots to be done, yeah, but there is a progress that is, is extremely fast happening. One concrete example, uh, the, one of the major uh, multi-religious organizations in the world called Religions for Peace, based in New York, uh, so uh, uh, its uh, current general secretary is a woman, Azza Karam, Professor Azza Karam is a Muslim woman. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, at the top of this multi-religious global organization. Uh, so this is this is a, one of the examples, uh, as you mentioned, that where we see important progress happening. And she's shaking things up. 
So we exactly. have a number of questions and I encourage people to put more. So let me let me take the, the first one that came in, uh, which is how can religious clergy end interreligious conflict and warfare, <laughs> just as examples between Buddhists and Muslims and Muslims and Christians, especially uh, to communities that insist on rejecting coexisting with people of another religion. What about religious lay persons? What uh, role should they play to end conflict between different religious communities? That's from Michael check in. So it clearly comes back to this question of peace, which is the title of our discussion. And in many ways, the end, the end goal of this culture of encounter that we're trying to encourage. Exactly. You know, I mentioned during our discussion that for me, pluralism is the answer to the right answer to extremism. But it's not only the right answer to extremism, it's also the right answer to religious nationalism, for example. Uh, because this is also, I mean, unfortunately, it's happening in many uh, places in our world today, where you have a kind of religious nationalism that is being used uh, uh, to, to, to feed conflicts, religious based, religiously based conflicts or discrimination against uh, some communities. So how to answer this and what is the role of lay people answering uh, 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 this situation to, to get to peace? Uh, I think first of all is, uh, is to reject any religious narrative that is exclusive to others. You know, uh, when people look and if people have the chance to look at, uh, you know, from a historic perspective, at the history of their own religion and, the, and its own narrative, they would see definitely in any religion uh, that there is always a, a kind of evolution, a progress or, or continuous change happening in the value system that shape at every moment, shape and reshape the interpretation of, of this religion in relation to its context. Uh, the, 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 the geographical context, but also in, in progressing in time too. So while I'm, I'm saying this, I'm saying this to, to, uh, to emphasize on a point that the religious truth is, is not a static one. It's always depending on interpretation. And the interpretation is related to our value system. We understand things based on our value. In fact, our value system is the filter uh, that, that uh, uh, help us helps us to understand or to misunderstand sometimes uh, things. So first responsibility of any person, lay or clergy person uh, in any community is to reject any religious uh, narrative that is exclusive to others or contain, uh, contains violence against, against others. Uh, why I'm saying this? Because of course, I'm, I'm daring uh, setting the values as the criteria of our of my belief, uh, and and not the other way around, because my belief depends always on how I understood it and how, how what type of interpretation I receive uh, about my belief. So, to to make sure that what I'm receiving is really coherent uh, uh, with what should be any uh, divine message, it should be tested uh, uh, by this question of uh, of uh, integration, of inclusion, of hospitality. You know of Look at all the religious texts you would see. Uh, uh, so the divine message is always to the whole humanity and not and not to mm -hmm. a category of people against the other. So this is first to filter our our ideas, religious ideas. Then secondly, to take initiative. And 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 our world is is full of very beautiful interface initiatives nowadays. And even in, in conflictual uh, regions, I will take the example of my organization, which is based in the MENA region, working in Lebanon, Iraq, uh, Yemen, Syria. I mean, all those completely destroyed countries by uh, conflicts and including religious-based conflict. And there are very beautiful people, men and women, young men and women. Most of them are lay people working together to face uh, uh, this uh, uh, conflictual reality and to rebuild the social network within their society. So we can always find a way to take initiative uh, to face uh, conflicts uh, in our societies. So that does take you into the peace building field, um, very much so. But 
uh, can we, um, we've, we started by focusing on the very personal friendship um, and common um, objective set by the Sheikh of Al-Azhar and, and Pope Francis. Um, maybe we could focus a bit on how the two of them are, are following up, maybe starting with the Sheikh of Al-Azhar, sort of from the, I guess that's really the Muslim intellectual world, um, and then maybe go back to Pope Francis and what he's actually pushing and which you've looked at so closely, the culture of encounter. Yes, if I take them separately, yeah. uh, one example from Al-Azhar uh, institution, you know, because Al-Azhar institution is the largest Islamic institution in the world. Uh, their, their followers who are, you know, uh, students either in their schools or universities all over the world uh, are counted by millions, you know, not by thousands. So it's a huge institution. And so I heard, directly heard from the Grand Imam and it was recently confirmed also that they are including in their uh, teaching classes the document of a human fraternity, which is, I think, uh, it, it can be considered a small step, but it's a very uh, mm -hmm. significant step, you know, when you include this narrative in, in teaching it in, in schools and, uh, and universities. This is a very small example. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I will take an another type of example. To, to go back to what I said, that this text is not, is not uh, I mean, the ownership of this text is not only for the Pope and, and the Grand Imam, it's for everybody because it's for humanity and they engaged everybody. So others are taking initiatives. Uh, and ex another example, uh, we, we collaborated with many uh, uh, faith-based institutions uh, like the Muslim World League that is based in Saudi Arabia, the uh, Middle Eastern uh, Council of Churches, uh, for all the Christianity in the Middle East and other organizations. And together we uh, worked on a common text uh, that is called inclusive citizenship. And it is available uh, 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 on, on the internet in English also. We can find it as a kind of consensus about how we understand we want to uh, uh, live together. Because I, I believe that the practical translation of human fraternity is inclusive citizenship. If we really want to move from the value level of a human fraternity as a principle and, and apply it and, and implement it in our daily life, this means that we have to work for inclusive citizenship, which makes all citizens equal, but also all citizens collaborating together for the common good. And this is happening. And, and uh, we were together in Abu Dhabi last year where another also uh, declaration was launched by the Abu Dhabi uh, Forum for Peace on inclusive citizenship. These are steps, I would put them in the same track, you know, in, in this process of, uh, of reception of the Abu Dhabi document and, and it's, uh, um, it's, it's um, a building on it, I would say, continuous, continuously building on it. Uh, these are a few examples not to uh, mention, so many others. So coming to the Christian Catholic side, and the follow-up there. How do you see the main threads? And maybe the, some of the issues, some of the, the roadblocks, the obstacles that stand in the way. Yeah, true. I think uh, the, the Christian community and more specifically maybe the Catholic community is challenged by this text. Uh, I, I would take two examples uh, because, uh, and uh, personal examples because I'm, uh, uh, at the same time, French citizens and Lebanese citizens. I will take these two examples to, to be very, very practical, I would say. In France today, there is a big challenge uh, of integrating uh, a, a minority that is not anymore a minority today, more than 10% of the population from an Islamic background. So uh, all of them are immigrants, maybe third or fourth in generation now, uh, but there is a huge problem within the French society today of integration of the Muslim uh, community within the, the French society. Personally, I believe, and I'm working for this, and I'm, I'm uh, pushing even the, the Catholic Church in France, because the Catholic Church in France has, has lots of resources that can be utilized uh, in uh, spreading the spirit of fraternity among Christians and Muslims through the collaboration for an inclusive citizenship. 
because I mean, it's useless to, to preach fraternity, for example, in France today, but at the same time to do nothing in helping uh, uh, the integration happening, uh, uh, fully happening for a community that is living there. The other example, if I go to Lebanon, it's, it's, it's completely different because Lebanon, that was known being a, in a model of coexistence and especially between Christian and Muslim is living nowadays a, a very suffering uh, uh, and problematic uh, uh, situation that is even threatening this principle of coexistence in Lebanon. And the church there and the Christians there are today holding the responsibility to learn how to protect this fraternal relation with Muslims while at the same time uh, uh, advocating and, and, and protecting, I would say, this inclusive citizenship system that was built together, and which means building a kind of a, of a screen, of a, of a wall against any attempt to impose a, a kind of Islamist, you know, uh, 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 um, approach of, of reshaping the state based on you know, uh, more uh, pro-Iranian, for example, uh, Islamic revolution narrative, or any uh, type of narrative that would destroy the, uh, the inclusive citizenship and the co coexistence in the country. So to conclude on this point, it's, it's not, uh, it would be dishonest, I would say, to pre preach about fraternity, either if we're preaching as Muslim or as Christian, to preach about fraternity and to accept uh, discrimination within our societies. Mm -hmm. it, it's dishonest, uh, and and the religious people cannot cannot uh, afford dishonesty. So so this is why, uh, uh, if we look for you know upholding and 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 uh, championing the value of fraternity, this automatically automatically means what are we doing in our societies to ensure that there is no discrimination and coexistence is built on and, and a, a, a positive uh, uh, system that I call inclusive citizenship. We have a number of interesting and challenging questions in the Q&A that we can come back to later, but we're coming to the end. So let me put a question that's pretty challenging, I would say, but okay. that will also give you a chance to- I, I like challenges. So it's here great. from Joseph uh, Myla, uh, what are the expectations in terms of practical political outcomes, uh, bringing religions together and bringing about peace settlements in societies where religious conflicts took place, such as Iraq and Lebanon? Wow. So, so where are we going? All, where, where does all let, this lead? Let me first of all say hi to my friend, uh, Joseph Myla. He was uh, in my in the jury of my PhD thesis, so he's my my professor. I would say he would answer this question much better than me. But uh, I I uh, take it very openly from him and uh, and thank him for giving this me this opportunity. I see our time is is uh, is finishing. So very 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 briefly, this is a big question. I think first of all, religious communities in post conflict countries. Take the example of Iraq or Lebanon. Uh, uh, has to do an internal work, uh, I would say, of purification of their own narrative and memories, uh, because they cannot engage with others uh, as long as they 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 uh, they adopt a narrative uh, built on fear uh, uh, and on on mistrust. You know, and I think these values uh, are um, really anti-values for any religion and within any religious community. So this would be a huge role in societies for religious communities is to start, you know, uh, reconnecting people together based on the renewal of trust, you know, facing the mistrust and, um, and liberating people from fear, which is not always happening. Sometimes, you know, religious people, uh, clerics uh, use fear to keep, you know, their followers within their own circles and to control them because it's much easier to control people who are afraid. You know, they 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 easily gather together in in in, in one space, uh, while liberating people from from fear. It's a risk, of course, that can be taken by by religious leadership. But I'm totally convinced, and by experience too, that this is the way 
uh, to make religious communities able to contribute in rebuilding the social network. So liberating people from fear, uh, building trust, uh, and this required, as I said, a kind of purification of uh, internal memories and, and, uh, and narrative. And, uh, and thirdly, uh, sometimes in some, in some uh, uh, um, uh, specific context, I would say, if I take the example of Iraq or, or of, of Lebanon, uh, the religious communities need nowadays and, and all the time to be challenged from inside to, to, to stay coherent in its own uh, social teaching, I would say, and, and, and political narrative, and not to fall into either the, the temptation of power, which take the community in a, in a, in a very bad uh, direction, or the temptation to uh, be manipulated by those who are in power, by the political power, you know, to please those who are in power for for uh, sometimes uh, very opportunistic uh, benefits from some for some religious leadership or uh, for the community. So this is this is another challenge also for religious uh, communities. The third and last one I would say is to uh, integrate uh, within their teaching the the citizenship uh, uh, framework, mm -hmm. which we are uh, uh, working day and night for this. I mean, within the Islamic or Christian communities in the MENA region, uh, to rethink uh, their so religious social teaching based on citizenship and the human rights. And there are lots of problems, but there are some very good also signs of uh, of change happening in, in the region. Well, I'm afraid that we've come to the end of our allotted time. Uh, so I must thank you very much for your very informed uh, and very thoughtful and, and challenging uh, comments about, about an experience that you have lived and are living and that we're all living. So we're very grateful to you. And we promise to follow up on the questions, uh, but also on this on this important conversation. So thank you all for joining. Uh, the recording you, will be available. Uh, and there is also an exchange between Fadi and I that's also available on the website. So thank you very much and have a, have a good day.